Hello, my friends. I'm back here. I'm Gene Della Sala, president of Audioholics. And I'm Hugo Rivera, vice president of marketing. Gene, man, we're getting some questions about all of these logos on people's receivers. I mean, especially the ones that are just starting out. They look at the stuff. They're like, man, it's like, do I need to have all that? What is this? You know, it's like, I don't understand what it is. It's you like know? NASCAR, man. <laughs> <laughs> I could have said it better. <laughs> you look at a modern receiver today and you get it out of the box and it's got so many logos on the front panel and sometimes they allow you to take the stickers off because it looks kind of cheesy. Yeah. It's like, what is this? What are they doing? It's information overload, my friends. Totally. So I think today we should be covering all these uh, surround sound formats, which is exactly what these logos are. They're okay. all formats. Yeah. So you know what? We have a nice list over here. And I think we probably should start at the very beginning, which is Stereo versus Dolby Pro Logic. Okay, well, we're, we're going way back, man. Way back, even before our college days. We're okay? going back, not to the future, but we're going back, <laughs> back, back to the past. Back to maybe the late 80s, okay? <laughs> yes. This is when I started getting into surround sound. So yeah, you know, traditionally you have stereo, which is two channel, right? Mm -hmm. Well, people wanted to hook their VHSs up to their stereos and they wanted to have surround sound. Mm -hmm. So the first generation of surround receivers came out with, Dol with uh, Dolby Pro Logic. Actually, not even Dolby Pro Logic, just Dolby Surround, mm -hmm. which was basically matrix surround channels no center channel yet right mm -hmm. then the next generation was Dolby Pro Logic which gave you the center channel now we're talking about analog format here we're talking about taking a two channel audio source running it through a decoder to derive five channels Wow okay okay and it was hit or miss I mean some of the movies sounded decent uh, but music never sounded good in ProLogic. It just never did. You would always use either a DSP mode or if there was a, a four channel or five channel stereo mode, that was always the way to go in those cases because ProLogic had, was very bandwidth limited. It was mono for the surround channels and it just did not sound good with music. Understood. Okay, so that's the very beginning. Then we moved on to 5.1 Dolby Digital mm -hmm. versus DTS. Well, that was an interesting debate that went on for many years. And I have to tell you, that was a significant step forward. Mm -hmm. When I first got my, I think it was a Yamaha RXV 992 or something, if I remember correctly, Dolby Digital Receiver with DTS. And when I first hooked up 5.1 discrete sound, mm -hmm. my mind was blown. Really? Okay. It was so awesome. I put on like Fluid Mac and the Eagles. And holy cow coming from ProLogic mm -hmm. it was like going from AM radio to FM or even beyond not XM because XM be, uh, is below you're right, right XM's horrible but let's not digress so um, yeah Dolby Digital and DTS are both lossy formats mm -hmm. means they're not bit for bit perfect that's what I was gonna you have to ask. use a digital connection you use Toslink or you use coax or in modern receivers now you use HDMI Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, for years, Dolby kept claiming, oh, we're equal to DTS. DTS is less efficient. That's why they have higher data rates. And Dolby Digital is more efficient, so we get away with the less data rates. In reality, DTS had 1.5. 1 1.5 1 megabits. Mm -hmm. And they, typically, the, the DVDs were decoded around half of that data rate, mm -hmm. which was still much higher than Dolby Digital. Dolby mm -hmm. Digital, I think, was 448 kilobits. Yeah, somewhere around there, I and think. And then I uh, think it went to 640 kilobits on Blu-ray. Right. But yeah, so for years, they, they, they kept running the scheme mm -hmm. saying that they were equal, right? No, they're not. But any, any audiophile knew that the best sounding uh, concerts they had were always in DTS, mm -hmm. never in Dolby Digital. Dolby yeah. Digital always sounded compressed. Um, Dolby Digital's stereo separation and surround channels was never as good as DTS's mm -hmm. was. And it just, in general, DTS sounded better. Only later they cut up, you know? <laughs> yeah. A <laughs> couple of years later, they came out with Dolby Digital Plus. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Dolby Digital Plus had a data rate, I think, of 1.7 megabits. Mm -hmm. Correct. So it was comparable to DTS. And you could hear, I love it now because I've got the Amazon Fire TV. Mm -hmm. And when I watch Netflix, it's in Dolby Digital Plus. Mm -hmm. And it sounds freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very close to a lossless Kodak. That's mm -hmm. how good Dolby Digital Plus is. And now, if it wasn't true, then why did they come out with that? Exactly. So yeah, it was funny because years later, I met one of the marketing guys from Dolby on a cruise ship at a mm -hmm. home theater cruise. And I said, mm -hmm. you know, this is when True HD came out. I go, you know, DTS sounds better. He goes, yeah, it might sound better than Dolby Digital, but now we have True HD. <laughs> so then they finally admitted, once Dolby True HD came out, Dolby Digital was like no longer sufficient, right? Now right. we have the revolution in right. surround sound. 
Uh huh. And it's actually true because the next generation of receivers that came out was with Dolby Digital True HD, True HD and DTS HD. Correct. Okay, these are lossless codecs. Could you explain to the newbies what that means, Gene? Lossless means it's bit for bit perfect. Mm -hmm. There's no truncations, there's no compression. Whatever the studio masses have, it's now in that multi-channel mix. Excellent. And you need a receiver that has HDMI 1.1 or greater to use it, and mm -hmm. you need a Blu-ray player because you can't do it with, with DVD. Right. You can't do it with coax, you can't do it with toss, like you definitely can't do it with analog, mm -hmm. unless you use six-channel analog outputs from the Blu-ray player into a multi-channel input of a receiver. But most people, it's better to use HDMI. You get better base management in the receiver, everything works better when you do it digital transfer. So Excellent. True HD, DTS HD, now, DTS kind of won the format war with Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's because it was easier in the studio to render one track and then scale it down to DTS lossy for people that didn't have it. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't have that Kodak. So DTS was pretty much the default standard for Blu-ray. Right. Well, moving forward, Dean, we have our favorite, Dolby Atmos came out. Yes, so now we got into immersive surround sound. Now we have Dolby Atmos. Versus DTSX. DTSX. And if you remember, Oro 3D as well. Correct. And they're basically, you know, they're similar. They're diff there's differences, but now you're talking about object-based audio. Mm -hmm. um, you're dealing with 32 channels, in the, up to 32 channels in the home for mm -hmm. Dolby Digital and DT, or, or Dolby Atmos and DTSX. And it's really like 10.1 for mm -hmm. Oro. You have the voice of God in Oro. Yeah, Oro has the voice of God, and then it has layers. It has the ear level speakers, and then heights front and back. I actually like that scheme better than sticking speakers in the ceiling, and especially doing bouncy house speakers. Yeah, we're not going to go there. <laughs> we're not going to go there. But, you know, um, there is a difference between how Atmos is implemented in the home versus cinema. Very important. Yes, a lot of people think that when they go to the cinema, that's what they're going to experience at home. But the the implementation is totally different. And we've confirmed this. Yeah, we've confirmed that basically there, there usually is not enough processing power mm -hmm. to do the rendering, the full object rendering in the cinema in the home. So in the in actuality, if you look at most AV receivers, and we've tested this, we've we've tested several Atmos receivers, they're really running in true HD with an extension on top of that for Atmos to run height channels. Right. Now, if you're not running the height channels, those get folded back into the bed channels, which are the seven basic channels. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, I mean, guys, you're still kind of dealing with true HD, or Atmos could also work over Dolby Digital Plus. Mm -hmm. So if Netflix ever upgrades to Atmos, it's most likely going to do it in Dolby Digital Plus because it doesn't have the bandwidth to run true HD. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, and then finally, how about the surround up mixers? Well, that's an important one because you know um, people want to take their two channel sources or sometimes just 5.1 channel sources and run all their speakers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we started out where Dolby had the you know Dolby Digital EX, mm -hmm. then they had ProLogic 2. Right. ProLogic 2 would take a two channel source and turn it to five channels. Right. Then ProLogic 2X would turn two channel or 5.1 to 7.1. Correct. And in my opinion, ProLogic 2X was superior to ProLogic 2. You, you, whether you use music mode or movie mode, I love ProLogic 2X. I mm -hmm. think it's a great rendering for a seven channel. And DTS has similar, they have the Neo and the Neo X. Mm -hmm. So you have those different flavors. And now they have it for, as well as the um, object-based immersive surround sound, they have the DSU, which is the Dolby up up mixer, mm -hmm. yes, and it uses that it utilizes the high channels, and then you also have um, DTS X as Neural X, right? So it's similar, and I've heard great things about Neural X. In fact, we've tested two receivers of Neural X, and our review is absolutely loved Neural X. Actually, mm -hmm. they preferred it over um, the Atmos up mixer. Interesting. And then Oro has its own Oromatic, I think right. it's called. Right, Oromatic, similar to Neural X, actually. Yeah, and DSU. Yes. So. so, you know, guys, typically if you buy a receiver today, um, you're not going to get a lot of these older formats right. like Dolby ProLogic and, and EX and all that. You're going to get all the new stuff. Mm -hmm. Supposedly Dolby Upsampler or the DSU is supposedly a quantum leap forward to ProLogic 2X. Mm -hmm. In my limited testing, I didn't find that to be the case, but there are people that may prefer it. 
But it's interesting because some receiver manufacturers like Yamaha, once they give you a technology, they don't take it away. No. And it's kind of, it's good and bad because it's good because you have everything at your disposal, but it's bad when you hit the wrong mode and you got to go through the 20 modes to get to the one you want. <laughs> you have so many options. Yeah. You, you have a historical archive of everything right there. Yamaha gives you everything. <laughs> Yamaha, my receiver still goes to ProLogic sometimes. I'm like, no, I want ProLogic 2X. Mm-hmm. Totally. So that's that's fun to know. And, you know, I, I think I forgot to mention uh, before the Atmos stuff came out, we had kind of a quasi Atmos with ProLogic 2Z and DTS had its own version where they added height channels and width channels. That was such a non-commercial it wasn't a commercial success, so mm -hmm. that's why I almost forgot to mention it. There wasn't many people implementing it. So Atmos is kind of the way to really get people on board because it's easier to implement for most people, especially if they're doing the bouncy house speakers and they want at least an approximation of height. Right. Especially when it's claimed that the bouncy house speakers can be placed by the fish tank. And, yeah, you know. and you know, that's a good point because, again, uh, we were told that it would be speaker agnostic. You could put your speakers virtually anywhere, but in reality, I know channels is a dirty word these days, but you still have channels, okay? You still have 5.1, 7.1, the ear level channels, and then you have the height channels, and they're still in fixed locations. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that concerns me about this immersive surround formats is they want you to all take off your bipole speakers off the sidewalls. Mm -hmm. They want you to use ear level speakers now, mm -hmm. and that could compromise people that have multi-row seating. Yes. Because now that speaker is going to be more localizable. Totally. And mo a lot of people prefer the diffuse sound field that bipole speakers offer. Yes. And there's never been confirmation whether or not Dolby recommends bipole speakers for surround channels. They kind of dance around it. Mm hmm. Yeah. That's really important to know, Gene. That's a really good point. So, you know, when you're thinking about implementing these technologies, make sure you have enough space to do it because you don't want to put speakers on top of speakers. Okay? Totally. I mean, analyze your room and, you know, use common sense. I mean, if you have a tiny, tiny room, don't think that you can go ahead and load it up with 32 speakers. It's just yeah. common sense, you know. That's it's called mass without class. My mass friends. without class. I mean, <laughs> really and truly, if you're going to go ahead and build up, uh, you need to make sure that you still have the definition to accompany it because otherwise you're just going to look like, you know, a hot mess. So, yes. <laughs> so I think with that said, Gene, we this has been a great video. I hope uh, this really helps out the people that are starting out and that are seeing all these uh, NASCAR logos out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And uh, anyways, if you like this video, click like on the button below. Let us know what you think. Comment. Uh, share this with your friends. And until next time, keep, keep listening. listening.